Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 7, verses 1 through 16, in our continuing study of the Old Testament prophets. Our passage begins, Isaiah chapter 7, and verse 1, with a historical narrative. Now, it came about in the, a- in the days of Ahaz, the son of Jotham, the son of Uzziah. Remember how we had had, uh, in the year that jo- Uzziah died, that had been back in chapter 6. Now we've moved forward past the death of Uzziah, past the days of Jotham, all the way up to Ahaz. Uh, notice he's king of Judah. And what, what happens now, that resident the king of Aram, and Pekah, the son of Remaliah, king of Israel, went up to Jerusalem to wage war against it, but could not conquer it. So what we have here is two of Israel's, I'm sorry, two of Judah's neighbors to the north, Israel and Aram. Aram uh, is the country up there today. We call it Syria, and it has its capital at Damascus. So Aram and Israel have teamed up to come up against Jerusalem to try to conquer it. Now, what's taking place on the national stage is you have far off Assyria. That's, that's the big threat. And so to, to try to mitigate against that threat, Aram and Israel and any other country that they can get to align with them, they're, they're putting together a big grand alliance uh, that they think will go up against Assyria. It's going to fail. It's going to fail miserably. But they don't know that. And so they're coming against Judah, and their idea is that we're going to T- capture Judah, we'll put a, a puppet king of our own choosing on the throne of Judah, and then that king will, of course, uh, enter in, into an alliance with us, and we'll get other countries to enter into an alliance, and we'll go, I'll go up against Assyria, and we'll bring Assyria to an end, and it's not going to happen. It's going to happen much more the other way, where Assyria is eventually going to come up down and gobble up both Aram and Israel. And to be fair, we'll actually try to gobble up Judah too, but that's another story. <clears throat> Verse 2, when it was reported to the house of David, saying the Arameans have camped in Ephraim. So notice, Aram has come down to Israel. Ephraim is one of the tribes in, in Israel just across the border uh, from Judah. His heart and the hearts of his people shook as the trees of the forest shake with the wind. This was bad news. No, this was very bad news. Verse 3, then the Lord said to Isaiah, go now, go out now to meet Ahaz, you and your son, Shear Yashub. <laughs> uh, I have to laugh because when, when you're a prophet, then uh, your sons are going to have prophetic names and, and uh, that might not be too enjoyable. But uh, he, Isaiah is to take his son. Notice they at the end of the conduit of the upper pool on the highway to the fuller's field. So um, by one of the waterworks that is there around Jerusalem. And say to him, take care and be calm. Have no fear and do not be faint hearted because of these two stubs of smoldering firebrands. And now he gets specific on who these firebrands are uh, on account of the fierce anger of Rezin and Aram and the son of Remaliah. The, these two kings that are coming against you, but God calls them, <laughs> they've already been blown out. They're, they're just firebrands. They're, they're like matches that you, you blow them out and now you have uh, just, you know, you have just a little bit of smoke coming and maybe a little glow. That's how these two kings are being described by God. Because Aram, with Ephraim and the son of Remaliah, has planned evil against you, saying, let us go against Judah and terrorize it and make for ourselves a breach in its walls and set up the son of Tabael. Notice they've already got the successor of He has chosen out. The son of Tabael has king in the midst of it. Thus says the Lord God, it shall not stand, nor shall it come to pass. It's not, their plan is not going to go anywhere. For the head of Aram is Damascus, and the head of Damascus is Rezin. You know, in other words, it all goes back to the, to the leadership. Now, within another 65 years, Ephraim will be shattered so that, it's, so that it is no longer a people. Their days are numbered. We come to verse 10. Then the Lord spoke again to Ahaz, saying, Ask a sign for yourself from the Lord your God. Make it deep as Sheol or high as heaven. Um, God says, look, I'm going to give you a sign, and you get to choose what it is. Verse 12, but Ahaz said, 
I will not ask, nor will I test the Lord. Now, I'm not sure what is going through the mind of Ahaz when he says this. Um, Sometimes I look at that and I say, well, should we be testing the Lord? But God had told him to to, to ask for a sign. So when God tells you to do something, go ahead and do it. Verse 13, then he said, listen now, O house of David, is it too slight a thing for you to try the patience of men that you will try the patience of my God as well? When God says to do something, even if it's sort of out there, then do it. Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. And here's a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. Now, that's, that's a familiar passage to many of us. But notice the passage doesn't end there. You go on to verse 15. He, and you say, well, well who is the he? Well, he is the, the, the person that you're talking about in the, in the previous verse. He, that is this person who's going to be born, and his name will be Emmanuel. He will eat curds and honey at the time he knows enough to refuse evil and choose good. So there's going to come a time where he, uh, he translates the sort of solid food. By the time he knows how to, to refuse evil and choose good, verse 16, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken. So there's going to be a child that will be born. We're even given his name, Emmanuel. And he's going to begin to grow and eventually will come to the point where he goes from his mother's milk to, to solid food, to curds and honey. And at that time, that's sort of the time when he, he knows between right and wrong, good and evil. And notice verse 16, for before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, and here's the whole point of this prophecy, the land whose two kings you dread, the the land of Israel and the land of Aram, those, those two kings, that area is going to be forsaken. It, you know, instead of them coming down and removing you, O Ahaz, from your throne, they are going to be removed. That's the point of the prophecy. It's a sign that relates to something that was going to happen in the days of Ahaz. And and by the way, sure enough, it took place. Sure enough, Assyria did come down. The This uh, idea of a, of a confederation of forces against Assyria did not work. And Aram and Israel were both taken into captivity by Assyria and ceased to exist, at least for that time and place, as nations, and those kings were indeed forsaken. Now, I want to go back to verse 14, because when we see this section, you see we're going to see this quoted in the New Testament, but before we look at the New Testament quote, I want to look again at the wording of this, therefore the Lord himself will give you a sign, behold, and notice, behold, a virgin will be with child. And when we look at the Hebrew text there, it's interesting when we look at just other translations. The Revised Standard Version uh, translates this as a young woman. Not, you know, not a young woman can be a virgin, but not necessarily. Or the New English Translation um, specifies that this young woman, and, and that might actually be a, a little bit more accurate, because you see, when we look at that phrase, the, the term itself, the Hebrew word, ha-alma, ha is just the word for the, so it's not a virgin, it's the virgin. And that's why the, the New International or, or New English translation said uh, this virgin. Uh, ha-alma, and that word alma uh, has the, I think my, my favorite way to translate it would be just to say the maiden, uh, the young lady. But young lady, you know, on, on the on the very young side, so not just young and married, but but normally a maiden, somebody who would normally be unmarried, and like my systematic theology professor Robert Raymond uh, used to say, uh, a gentleman assumes the best, you know, that that she is indeed a virgin, but that might be assumed. That's not stated in the word itself. And so the translation that was given by those other two translations, uh, calling it a a young girl, a young lady, um, a maiden, that's all accurate. And then you say, well, how did we get the translation that we're reading here? A virgin. And it comes at least in part, I think, from the Greek Septuagint. 
Now, notice I put the letters L, X, X, uh, of course, in Ro those are the Roman numerals for the number 70, and that's an abbreviation for the, uh, for the Septuagint, according to uh, an old tradition, the Septuagint. Of course, the Septuagint is the Greek translation of the Hebrew Scriptures, um, and the old tradition is that it was translated by 70 different scholars, and so hence that's why it gets its name. Septuagint is just Greek for 70, or we put the Roman numeral 70, and, and that stands for that. And, and notice that they took that word and they translated it as hey parthenos. Hey is the word for the, the you know, it's the definite article. And parthenos is the word, not for just a young lady, but for a virgin specifically. Now, why did they translate it that way? And my answer is, I don't know. Maybe they assumed the best too. Maybe they, they just assumed, you know, well, if she's a, a young maiden, she's, she's not married, she's a virgin. Um, and I think perhaps that was the assumption that they went on as they translated this particular passage. They translated it the virgin. Now we come to the New Testament, and this passage is going to be quoted in Matthew chapter 1, beginning in verse 18, where we read of the birth of Jesus. Uh, the birth of Jesus was as follows. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child, not by reason of a man, because she was, she, again, she was a young woman who's not married. Um, she was a virgin, and she was found to be with child by the Holy Spirit. And Joseph, her husband, being a righteous man and not wanting to, to disgrace her, planned to send her away secretly. He was planning on a private divorce because he was not expecting a virgin birth because the Hebrew text of, of you know, of course, uh, he was familiar with, with the book of Isaiah, but the Hebrew text doesn't say anything about how a virgin will conceive. And there was nothing in Jewish theology, there was nothing in Jewish eschatology, and by eschatology I mean uh, their, their views of future prophecy, there was nothing at all in Jewish teaching that expected a virgin to conceive and bear a child. If you had asked them about Isaiah 714, they would have said, oh, that was a young woman that had a baby, and that was a sign for way back then. And that took place 700 years ago. And as far as that goes, they would have been right, because it had taken place. And so Joseph does not bring Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14 into mind. That's the furthest thing from his mind. He feels, he, he just assumes, that his wife, his, his bride-to-be, she's not his wife yet, has been unfaithful, and so he plans to divorce her. And you say, well, why is he divorcing her? Because when you were betrothed in that culture, the only way to break a betrothal was by a divorce. You didn't just give back the, the engagement ring. You actually had to go through and give a certificate of divorce. And he's planning on doing this, but he wants to do it privately and secretly so as not to disgrace her, not to bring dishonor, further dishonor upon her. Verse 20, but when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife, for the child who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you will call his name Jesus, for he will, Jesus, his people, uh, the word Jesus means to save, uh, for he will save his people from their sins. And then we have an explanation, verses 18 and following, actually, verse 20, uh, 20, beginning verse 22. Uh, now all this took place to fulfill what, what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. And now it's going to quote this particular passage. Behold, the virgin shall be with child. Now remember, Matthew, uh, we have Matthew not in Hebrew, but we have Matthew in Greek. And so it's, it's quoting and it's giving the same quote that we see in the Greek Septuagint. The virgin, the Parthenos, the, uh, literally it means that, the virgin will be with child and shall bear a son, and they will call his name Emmanuel, which translated means, and we're going to see later on in the book of Isaiah, uh, in that, that Hebrew word Emmanuel is actually going to be seen sometimes as a name, sometimes just when it's going to be saying God is with us. And that's what it means, God with us. Now, what's been happening here? 
You see, Isaiah had given a prophecy, and we've already likened this to looking at at two mountain peaks, one very close, one very far. And when you're looking at the mountains from the vantage point of the prophet, you cannot tell that there is a valley in between. But now as we come to the New Testament, we we begin to see, yes, there was not only that prophecy that had application to the prophet's day, uh, speaking about the kings of Aram and the king of Israel that would be removed, but also there was a further peak, a further application of this prophecy that pointed to the one who would be born, not just of a young woman, but of a virgin. That the same prophecy, the, the one prophecy, had two different applications, two different, can I say it this way, two different fulfillments. And so this first fulfillment, the immediate fulfillment, is seen in Isaiah's day with a young woman who eventually gives birth to a son. And his birth would be a a sign that Ahaz would be saved from the political threat that he was facing. But when we look at the later fulfillment, we see Jesus, who was born of a virgin, and who is himself God with us. And his birth is a sign that we who believe in him will be saved from our sin. And this brings us to our final question. Have you believed in him? Have you come to faith in the one who is himself God with us?